All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, see, ooh, okay. <laughs> Seeing as it's three o'clock, let's, let's get this started. Uh, welcome to the panel on 5G and uh, misinformation. What we're going to look at is uh, some of the persistent myths surrounding the new technology, uh, how it is actually going to be applied, how, <coughs> let's say, maybe its use, its initial use and the initial changes coming up might have been overstated in the media a little bit and have scared plenty of people as well. And, um, and uh, how different actors in the media have been involved in, well, in a way they promoted the new technology, but pr potentially not necessarily in the best possible way. So, uh, myths in detail, the actual effect that the coverage has had lately, for example, uh, trials of 5G base stations that needed to be postponed because there were, he were health concerns in the population, because there was uh, political opposition to, uh, to these projects and so on. And um, uh, with me here on the panel are, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, Ingmars uh, Boutis, uh, the Vice President and Member of the Board at uh, Latvia Mobile Phone. Uh, then we've got John Tully, CEO at Microtech, a uh, wireless equipment manufacturer. And we also, not on the stage, but very important over there in the corner, we have uh, Uldis Czernevskis, who is the 5G project leader at Microtech. And as such, possibly the, uh, yeah, the, the one great expert that we've got in this room here. So if anybody's got any questions about what we're talking about now, uh, you might want to ask Uldis later. Okay, uh, what we're going to start off with is uh, a question for, for Ingmars, first off. What does 5G actually mean for the telecommunications industry? Well, thank you. So the, um, that's the probably the one billion or trillion uh, uh, euro question here. <laughs> is because, the, I mean, the hype about the 5G has been enormous, and it has al always been the case with all the previous uh, generations, the, the 3G, the 4G. This, th this time, why the mobile telcos are so choked up about this new technology is because the, for the first time in history, we will be uh, a business level network. It has never happened uh, before. All the previous generations were uh, best, e best efforts, so meaning we were not able to guarantee anything to our uh, customers. We were trying very hard uh, and doing our best, but we were not able to sign, let's say, a, ser a service level service level agreement with our corporate customers. This time is different. The 5G is primarily uh, industrial uh, network. It will not concern so much um, as a normal people. It will uh, give a possibility to industri industrialize uh, many things that, that, that was not possible uh, before. Uh, namely, that will be um, um, all kinds of uh, sensors, low power sensors, network slicing, all these security f uh, features, and actually the sheer speed, which has been the uh, deal breaker for 20 years, is not the biggest uh, uh, news here. I mean, the industrialization is the big thing. Um, and going on from there, what are the implications for the manufacturing side and for the industries involved? We've heard a lot about Huawei lately and uh, how they have been part of potentially some of the misinformation that's been going on as well. Um, <coughs> from the point of view of somebody who produces these devices, what is changing? Uh, well, surely um, the, Huawei, the Huawei situation has, um, with the US government's, uh, let's say, pushing down or let's say thinking and uh, not, not suggesting Huawei for usage in a lot of uh, NATO countries has opened up um, a market for customers that would like uh, other solutions. Uh, the technology uh, has pushed us to invest in larger uh, systems which LMT has helped us with and uh, developing uh, uh, let's say higher speed uh, technology towers and and uh, base stations. So I think uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ingmars for that. <laughs> um, where, where we're looking at, at this specific case and also the American reaction to it, uh, we're, we're actually, I mean, I mean, these fears may be founded up to, up to a certain point, but we're also dealing from the point of view of somebody working in the media with a sort of conspiracy theory 
that is decades old and that is for example that the NSA has built in a backdoor into every single instance of Microsoft Windows on every single computer. That's a story that's been going around already when I was a teenager. I've heard that before. So now uh, on, on, a, on a broader scale this has made it into the media in connection with 5G as well in the sense that if we're looking at the technology that is going to connect the refrigerator in your house and your car and virtually all the devices that you're using with one another and hooking them up to a central network. Um, is there a real danger that we're all going to be spied upon? Well, in that's Mars. really something we should ask probably the audience here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what I know is that essentially nearly everything today is it it doesn't matter is it a 5G or not 5G. I mean, all the cars that are on the streets in 2004, they all have computer networks, uh, sensors, and motherboards, and everything else. I mean, I mean, this has been ha uh, happening for many, many, many years. There's no big news uh, here. I mean, the thing with the 5G is probably this time that this somehow there's f many, many f factors uh, flowing together and and and. and this techno hype which has been produced by the vendors and operators is super high like us alone uh, we have been also we also have been making very loud statements about the 5g all the other operators in in the in the, in the region in the usa in china everywhere everybody is speaking about something something big is going to, to happen and actually nobody is giving a, a decent answer what will actually happen and therefore missing one of the basic things is that people are placing this classical fear of something big and powerful coming to your house and of course they are scared. But there is so no human, exp human explanation what the 5G was, is going to actually do. So in a sense there's like a dividing line between the actual technology and the actual facts of the technology and the image of it that has been that has been uh, uh, that has developed in in the public in the sense that there's going to be this grand revolution where from today to tomorrow suddenly everything is going to be interconnected. That's not actually going well, to it's happen. Not definitely will not happen within one day. I mean, we will see the gradual uh, evolution over, let's say, I don't know, ten years, and this will probably the other difference with the previous uh, generations. We could actually switch on the 4G network. We actually did and many other operators did, and it, it was just there, I mean, it, that the 4G was on. Uh, with the 5G, I mean, building the network itself is the easiest part, I mean, and this is the part which is, which has the m most of the, uh, so to speak, um, uh, uh, focus these days, but the, the hardest part is ac actually to identify what would you actually do, because this is uh, something we are seeing with our big uh, business customers, and on all sides of sectors because they have no rational expectations. What will I change in my business process to actually use the benefits of the 5G? And that's the that's the that's the that's the classical trap. I mean, because ev everybody is talking about the big speeds, low latencies, and all the other stuff, but the day day to day stuff just rolls on. I mean, the banks work, the man man manufacturers use. So, actually, the biggest, the hardest part of the 5G. Will be actually, I don't know. It's kind of a business restructuring part on the in on the industrial side. Building the network is easy. It's really easy. We've been doing this for many years. We will do this again. We will build 5G network. So what? So the the the, the big question is, what will you do with it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that obvious. Today. Yeah, and interestingly enough, that's not really a question that comes up in the media. Uh, very often, what is what what is it going to mean in practice? You get a lot of rather broad articles that make rather broad reference to the impending technological revolution and how it's all going to be fabulous and completely different. But what actually changes is, is less well known. John, uh, John uh, what, what is the actual leap that's taking place from 4G to 5G? What's technically different? Um, <coughs> I think all this can help us out on some of the newest technologies. We have uh, <coughs> new frequencies that are being enabled by that technology. We have higher coding rates, so more data can go over uh, the airwaves. Uh, we have uh, more sensitive radios. We have, um, and Aldous has some, some new information, maybe he can help out. So yes, uh, basically the biggest uh, advantage of the 5G from a technical point of view is new frequencies. New frequencies uh, means uh, more speed. 
and uh, that gives us a lot of benefits of uh, utilizing new technologies where we couldn't like do before, maybe on the slower uh, speed. So that was the main advantage, and uh, it's like uh, optimizing 4G to the 5G. It's not like something new that is made just like now. It's not a big revolution. It's like just a little evolution of something. So, like the, to to stick with this, don't don't leave yet. Yes. Um, the mm -hmm. the this this one interesting thing, like when we're talking about frequencies, we are now talking about a higher frequency band than previously, and. Um, we, we talked about this uh, before the panel quite a bit, and one very interesting fact for me, as a relative newcomer to the technical side of this whole thing, was that 5G, uh, the, the field itself, cannot penetrate human skin. So basically, the whole, the whole thing that's going on at the moment in terms of health-related risks and so on and so forth is blown out of any kind of proportion. So how is this exactly? The, the and, and that, ah, that was the, the other interesting detail. So the more stations, the more lo the more low power output stations you've got mm -hmm. in one area, the less of a health risk you've actually got. Yes, it's, it's mm -hmm. all yes. it's all very interesting. Maybe well, you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yes, uh, basically, uh, when we had all the two G, three G, and four G, uh, you were required to high, have a higher output power to reach the customers. Now uh, with the 5G and the uh, like higher, uh, more frequencies, you can like directly point uh, better this uh, frequency to your specific customer. With that, you can uh, not don't need to use more auto power, and, and also like you were also mentioning that higher frequencies, like uh, more like 24 gigahertz up to like 28 gigahertz, cannot penetrate your skin so well. So it is not so harmful like uh, previous generations could like. Be, be called, like told. Yeah, and the reason why this is so interesting is, is essentially because most of the criticism of, of where they talk about uh, electromagnetic uh, magnetic radiation and so on uh, actually goes back to a study, a single study conducted in 1999 with a 2G network uh, on rats. And uh, one group of those rats developed heart tumors. But today, where we would need to ask, well, are these test results applicable to humans as well? The answer is no. And is 2G technology comparable in terms of its effects to 5G technology? The answer is no as well, and the study is 20 years old. Um, most of the media reports that you see today are not sufficiently well researched and just jump to the conclusion that it's necessarily harmful, and they leave it at that. There's usually no more explanation. We have kind of a day-to-day -day, uh, battle for getting rights for building out a new base station. Uh, so because it's always the case. So there's always money. There's always technical capability. It's not always there's a right to actually build it. So the classical discussion with some local self government would be exactly about first of all they don't look they don't like how it looks. Well, that's the classical part. And the other part they are afraid of the radiation. So one of the classical uh, answers to this, this one is actually the, the, the very human notion that the, your, your phone actually needs more power to reach the base station if it's, uh, if it's, f if it's uh, far away. So the uh, closer the base station is, the actually less power it is uh, using. It, it doesn't always help, of course, because the generally the fantasy of base station being next to your backyard is always bad. I mean, that's the uh, so in all the places where there is a big areas of low rise buildings, we always have the coverage issues, not because we are greedy and not building base stations, because the, there's the classical problem of having the rights of, of actually building. So everybody wants, wants to have a very good coverage and no, and no base stations uh, um, at all. So that's the uh, ideal world. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and <coughs> in a sense, tragically, that's exactly what the reporting and plenty of media ties into. For example, uh, the German language press had one stock image going around for several months where you basically saw uh, a, a young mother with a pushchair and the pushchair was basically uh, was, was right above what looked like a sewer lid but was actually an underground antenna. And that image went through all the big newspapers. And the implication was, because 5G is going to need lots and lots and lots of these small base stations, we are now basically exposing 
newborns and toddlers and so on to, to high frequency electro electric radi uh, electromagnetic radiation and so on. So, so there you go. Whatever, whatever technological aspect there is, there is seldom an actual discussion and an actual ex explanation of why it is that way and what it is exactly. But the jump to conclusions instead. Very interesting point to make here will be actually to, to actually make some analysis uh, geographically when this topic is uh, starting to happen because it's like three, four months ago I was in Poland and I was totally not ready because all my fellow operators I talked to, that was the main topic they actually talked. They were speaking to me about the 5G protests and I was like, what? Like what? Uh, protests and, uh, and there's a very big topic among them. This is the, the, the main subject because why is the main subject? Because if the the government is making the lower um, reg regulation for radio electromagnetic field power, it actually means they have to spend much more money to actually for building out networks. So the Poland has actually decreased the uh, regulations. So they will. Uh, it has happened, and then all of a sudden it started also here, like I don't know two months ago, from many different small points, this also started to, to happen. There, there's a Facebook group uh, against the 5G. There we are receiving letters from different local cell governments asking to guarantee that we will not build out the 5G network in their um, proximity. Um, there are now, we have big, I mean, many small topics. I mean, probably they are just a reaction, and most likely they are just, they have some superstition has built up in this narrative, but um, it's it's the, then there's a new from uh, from Estonia, and then there's news from uh, Brussels, from all over the, the place. The, the people are uh, getting more more scared, and in sense of informational safety, there is uh, increased vulnerability building up because this topic is becoming vulnerable. Yeah, and, and and again, like the the uh, uh, these exact <coughs> points turn out to be the snake oil for some actors in the media, for example, in Russia today, that is flogging this as something that is now apparently causing cancer, autism, goodness knows what else. There's a list of about 10 different points of, of all the health risks involved with 5G. Um, obviously, not one of them can be, can be backed up with any kind of data. And uh, funny enough, I mean, the, the, there's, a, there's another very large topic looming, actually, and that is that of the whole climate debate, because not only are we under threat by global warming and so on, but apparently, John, we are, we are, the next best thing is going to be that we won't be able to predict the weather accurately anymore either because of frequency interference. How's uh, that? Yeah, one of the frequencies is near um, a weather prediction um, from satellites. And... Um, but uh, I, I think the regulatory bodies, if there are any issues, there'll be feedback and they'll correct them. That's what usually happens in the regulatory world and it, it, it won't cause any disturbances. So mm -hmm. you can rest assured. Okay. Also, the, the point is that uh, they're like theoretical, like they're talking that it could be. So since there's not so many or maybe not so bigger or wide 5G like base stations deployed, so we cannot like tell that it for sure there will be such uh, issues or problems or like percentage of uh, like uh, weather forecast will go down because of this. So for that all we have like uh, all those regulatory bodies in each like uh, world FCC, Europe, etc. that like regulates, regulates auto power and if there will be some kind of pro problems most likely we will deal that with uh, lowering the auto power that frequency. So how do these uh, regulating authorities compare, for example, if you look at the United States and compare them with the European Union? I think uh, compared to the Wi-Fi, usually uh, for US uh, based like FCC usually have a little bit higher limits. Europeans uh, usually have a lower limit outputs. So. so we're even more cautious here. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But um, Ingmar's then, um, th that doesn't worry the telecommunications providers that there is no telling at this point what the actual application of this technology on scale will, will, will cause or, or no, no, no. will look Well, like. it slowly starts to show, of course. I mean, there are probably two sides of, of this. I mean, us being so loud about it and talking so much about it with our big customers and, and customers being so excited, uh, they are talk, talking to us and some stuff is starting to emerge. Uh, the good thing is a lot of this stuff is actually doable already today with the existing... Uh, 
evolved 4G technology. I mean, the super clear, super only 5G cases are not so many, but they are starting to emerge. I mean, of course, if we will do something with, if we will do something with al autonomous vehicles, it is clearly not in, 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 in the field of 4G, mm -hmm. merely by the latency. I mean, the, the milliseconds ne needed to be part of the traffic are so low. The f uh, 4G by architecture is not capable of doing this, so this is clearly why I'm saying if, because this topic is also very super filled with legends and fantasies, like one of the classical ideas is that all, that all the sensors of all the cars will, rate, will tr transmit all the data all the time somewhere. I mean, this is so strange, and why would uh, this happen? And um, because al already today there are lots of sensors Lots of so speak, mathematics is being done on board. There is no need to actually to transmit all of it summer away, uh, even, I mean, and so on. So most likely the 5G at the very first um, stages will be built out on the important parts of the, the roads, uh, but the cars that themselves are cap capable of communicating in 5G standard between themselves. You, you, don't, have to, you, you, don't, even need a, uh, you don't need a base station for 5G communication to happen between two, two vehicles. So there's too many fan fantasies and we're just totally sure that the 5G will never be the only media that will control this super dangerous thing as, which is a autonomous vehicle. So there will be many, many uh, actors that will actually uh, conduct this stuff. Plus, yeah, so I mean, uh, there's, there's quite many, but so the, 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 the transportation is, uh, uh, one thing, uh, many things in industry, all the things that need, like for instance, I learned recently that um, I didn't realize that before that many of pr producing, uh, producing companies, they need to rearrange their product production lines very, uh, very frequently. And actually the wiring itself is a, a problem if you need to adjust very rapidly to, to the uh, change in, 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 uh, in the demand. So you actually need to reshuffle the stuff and therefore the 5G within the factories is probably one of the other use cases. And of course, all the, the sensor stuff, the medicine, there's quite many. It's, it's, it starts to build up, of course, but it's, it's, it's still the most of the media coverage goes to just pure hype like this. Everything will change. It's not very helpful, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, uh, Ingmar's used the word superstitions before, which actually I think is quite fitting for the total loss at which the public seems to be concerning this technology and understanding it. Uh, is there the possibility that the manufacturers and maybe the, the engineering side has done something wrong? Could you have explained things better? Well, I, th I think the marketing side has really uh, pushed the possibilities of 5G, which um, uh, many of the new features give great possibilities, but they're not so explain well explained. So sometimes people use their imagination or exaggerate, or the marketers do. And uh, that, um, that drives the demand. For example, AT&T in America, even before they actually had a 5G, put a 5G logo where it usually shows your LTE or 4G. So um, it's become a kind of a competitive uh, um, issue to try to get to get 5G on your phone or in your device because of the great uh, expectations. But also that sometimes brings uh, fears of what some big change in technology could bring. So it brings suspicion and, uh, and some of these things that we're discussing in, in the forum today. And I wonder if some people, maybe eventually we could hear what some of the audience has heard as well. Cause yeah, yeah we'll, we'll have, by the way, we'll have, in the end, we'll have 10 minutes for, for question and uh, questions and answers. So we'll, we'll get to that point, definitely. And, 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 and given the complexity of, of this topic and the complexity of this technology, uh, from the point of view of the media, which is really the only one I can talk about sitting here, is, uh, is that people tend, when, they when, when people encounter something that they cannot understand, that they cannot grasp, they tend to either come up with an explanation that satisfies them, or they'll go for the next best explanation that they, that they can get behind. That's why you get the anti-vaxxers uh, who 
wouldn't want to put up with medicine or biochemistry or anything like that. So they'll go for a myth or, a, or, a, for, or for something else instead. And you get a, a similar kind of effect with 5G as well. And this, this occasionally becomes, becomes quite evident in the media as well when you have people in the very quick and always slightly superficial 24-hour news cycle reporting on these new, these new technologies and, and the things related with them. Uh, because, for example, if you're talking about an online news portal, there simply isn't the time for somebody who has to churn out 10 to 15 pieces a day at least to look at any of these things in depth. So if the research time that you spend on this is 25 seconds on Google, and Google ranks its results according to, to popularity and, and hits, it's, it's quite natural that you end up with the same top layer of, of, of superficial information time and again and across all different media channels. So that is definitely uh, uh, a big issue there as well. And I don't know, uh, Ingmar, wh whether, whether, whether you've, 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 had, you've noticed any of this. Yeah, I can share some trick I uh, learned uh, recently. Not so recently, actually. I was, of course, all the telcos all the time tried to measure themselves up to the other. I thought, well, how are we doing? And of course, we are uh, one of the best telcos there is on, on this planet. And uh, it's actually true. I can uh, prove this by numbers. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, but one of the, the tricks I learned, and I was reading the, the news, what's happening elsewhere, I always do. And I was getting seriously uh, depressed uh, until I learned this trick. And uh, because I was reading that. Uh, uh, there are flying cars there uh, and flying cars here and, uh, and somebody is always thinking about the 6G and, uh, and so on and I was, I was we are so behind and, <laughs> and, uh, and I was we need to do something faster and, uh, and, oh. and then I learned when you read these texts there's always these little uh, words like soon, will be, is thinking, is, is planning and then, you, then you, when you start to notice those it gets a lot, lot easier because, I mean, 99.9% .9 of these super cool statements are normally about is thinking, is planning, is doing, is trying, is testing, is... And, uh, and then I have traveled around quite many places and there's not so many uh, uh, wide spec, wide deployments of, s of, of something because normally th there's a test case here and it, it, it not only goes to the telcos, it always goes to the cities Every city that at least has some a little bit of pride uh, these days have some smart city uh, uh, project. And if you read about I don't know Amsterdam, Copenhagen, or whatever, then you get the not notion or Barcelona or what, you know many 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 beautiful places around the planet. You get the idea they are I mean they are already living somewhere in you know one one hundred years in the future. Everything is super. Uh, digitalized when you travel to this particular city, you know, it's still the same. It's you know there are still cars, houses, people walking around, people waiting in lines, and so on and so forth. And they're still normal. And of course, I'm not saying I'm not neglecting. I mean, there's many cool things happening, but how this uh, for us to get some time in media, we need to be very, very, uh, very loud and everybody is learning very quickly. So you have to make this statement very futuristic. And so this total sum of these, all these messages create, uh, and there's this big difference which is actually happening on the street and which is all these nice uh, statements. I mean, there is, so you have to read very carefully. And, 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 and also thinking about all of these statements in addition to the health concerns, in addition to the conspiracy theories, in addition to all of these, these uh, fears in the public about this technology, there is, uh, there is also the additional interesting question, who should actually be the company or the authority providing the answers? Who could actually do the explaining? Because if we refer or if we we as the media tend to refer to a 20 year old study that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're faced with today who will we turn to for better information or in other words why isn't there a similarly prominent store a, a newer study why don't we know about anything like that john um, <coughs> when you go into the details of the technology it kind of gets overwhelming, I think, for the, for the average person that isn't interested in, in you know, infrastructure telecommunications. And that's, um, so that leaves a message and the way it's explained to, to 
create some confusion. Uh, how to how to how to organize uh, how to explain to people better. I guess in practical analogies might be the best thing. You could talk about where it would help them and where it won't change anything. So uh, there'll be less confusion. Yeah, and in that sense, of course, one of the big issues is that people tend not to trust experts anymore. So if somebody's got their mind made up and thinks that, yeah, 5G is harmful, you can line up 10 medical experts that testify to the opposite and people won't be listening. So that's, yeah, that's definitely a big issue as well. So now uh, moving on back to, or moving on back to, moving on to Huawei again and the uh, uh, the accusations that there might be safety issues with the technology and so on. Um, I hear that there are already companies that are in trouble uh, getting the parts that they need to put their devices together uh, well because, because, of, because of American restrictions on importing them. Uh, yeah, certainly they're in a difficult situation and there are many of their customers that put them in a difficult situation. Uh, for future deliveries and the expectations of their customers, the end users. And um, so it's going to, we'll have to see how it plays out. No, it's, uh, I don't think we, we really know for sure, but there is a lot of, let's say, expectations for the future. Or could uh, these problems, if they do get resolved, could they happen again? Uh, so for companies like LMT and other companies in the world, they have to look for um, you know, alternative suppliers. And of course, a company I work for and Oldis works for, we are making uh, also LTE and uh, 5G devices in the future. So that's one uh, I'd like to sell some equipment. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, well, it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, uh, Ingmar's mentioned before, before the panel as well that uh, Apparently, consumers don't care at all no. that uh, that who that Huawei might potentially be involved in anything like that. They don't care. Has the have the sales figures for these phones gone down? No, no, they haven't. I mean, we were of course uh, we were somewhat uh, stressed when it all because I mean, but simply put, we have a stock of Huawei phones for our shops. So I mean, what will happen with them? People will not buy them. Uh, that would seem very very rational move to my mind from a uh, consumer perspective but uh, we haven't seen this uh, happen so far people either are assured or that they will be able to still use it by all the other statements or they haven't paid a attention or both but somehow uh, nothing like this has ha happened having said that of course i have to uh, make a remark here uh, that we as an operator we don't use any Huawei technology within the core network. So our network is in no way related to Huawei. I mean, we are, I mean, of course, the end user stuff. That's the whole different topic here. But uh, we are we feel quite blessed by our longstanding strategy of cooperating with Nokia for many, many years. So we are a Nokia only network. So in that sense, yeah, and on the safe side. Yeah, and, and, and this, has, this has interesting implications for uh, local manufacturers and local companies as well, because as, as John mentioned, Microtech actually produces these devices as well and has a workaround for companies that cannot get access to uh, Huawei parts anymore. And also uh, we make uh, these devices, or many of them in Latvia and uh, the Baltic Republics and in Europe with uh, Western technology such as Qualcomm and, uh, and European parts providers. So. So we have something that, uh, yes, question? So, uh, can I just ask a question? Why is Huawei the market leader? What is it that, you know, they, they've obviously got a huge share of the market. Um, the British GCHQ office, which examines their technology every year, complains that from a, both a hardware and a software point of view, it's not properly put together. And I did understand if it's such rubbish, why is it doing so well? Um, are we, c can, you, can you explain why Huawei got its, uh, its, is it a technological edge or are they just good at selling it or, or what? Well, c well currently for the, for the, verti for the products uh, such as the home LTE access points, uh, they're vertically integrated, meaning in business terms that they actually have a subsidiary called High Silicon which makes the chips and the technology for the LTE and the 5G. And they also assemble the final product with the Huawei brand 
which they would sell to companies, uh, lo local network, mobile network providers. So this provides kind of a, an advantage uh, in a sense uh, that they can really control the cost of their products. They don't have to buy chips from another company. And then uh, they can also use that advantage since they're kind of, they're one group of course, they own the chip maker, which is, a, which is um, an expensive part of a device that is uh, the technology and the chips, the intellectual property, and, um, and the actual, actual radio parts. So since they own this, they can also, I would say they have the ability to, say, make very competitive prices in certain markets and maybe higher prices in other markets. So they have, have control of the pricing. And probably, uh, probably they're clearly not rubbish uh, in the sense that their technology it is competitive. It's not, you know, it's not uh, bad. I mean, I'm not going the distance here to saying who is better. I mean, the Ericsson, Nokia, or Huawei, but they are, you know, there is a quite it's a very, very competitive situation. So combined with some a little bit more aggressive pricing uh, from Huawei's side, I mean, this has always been very lucrative for telcos to uh, switch some equipment for Huawei. That's been the case for quite many years now. So they are not rubbish, clearly. The, all the whole concept of buying of radio electronic equipment from a communist country, that's a whole different topic here. Uh, but they are not rubbish. So in that sense, why did you opt for Nokia in well, your particular case? In our case, we have been following the strategy that uh, buying from single vendor is safer because we, if you do it from many vendors, they are always doing this if something is not working. And telco systems are quite complex, as you might imagine, and there is always something happening. I mean, it's not, it's not stable. It's, always there is, it's, <laughs> it's quite fluid, so you have to be... You have to keep a one guy accountable for what's happening, and we have we have always had our temptation moments. Uh, we have been uh, strong, <laughs> and we have been re re rewarded in the in the long term in the sense of stability of the network as such. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and and uh, the the technical side and mm -hmm. business side how this goes on, of course, there there's a, an entirely different aspect to it as well, and that is how many different companies and operators will actually be able to uh, get these frequencies. There's in, in frequency auctions where they're auctioned off, we in Estonia recently had the issue that while the three major mobile providers were involved in, in these auctions and, and you know stood a chance of actually getting the frequencies as well, there were complaints from smaller companies that have been working with 5G and with developing the technology uh, who who complained that they they didn't stand a chance. There were just three frequencies in there, three major telecommunications providers. So, how uh, how does this enter into the picture? How will companies different from mobile providers be developing solutions and applications for five G in the future? Is there a, a great like opening up of the market to be expected? Well, we are seeing this already happening. And there are, uh, I mean, the whole business of frequencies is, of course, that's why it's regulated because the amount of frequencies it's just, you know, it's limited. So, but there are frequencies which are free, f so to speak, free, f free for all. We have now see there are in the region there are small players who are building private LTE networks for let's say ports, uh, which are not the big, uh, the big operators. So this is happening already today. This is got a predecessor for the 5G functionality. So it's not unusual. Of course, the classical problem, this uh, will, the practical thing is this frequency is, there's the risk of interference. And this will, of course, will be a problem probably in the future. And I mean, that's the whole reason why the telco market is being regulated because the amount of frequencies is limited. There is no workaround, it's just physics. So, uh, but the smaller players will act. I mean, I think, uh, and definitely in indoor, in indoor solutions and in smaller cases, they are, are all already active. And, we, 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 and this is probably good because the big, fat and arrogant telcos like me will just uh, face a decent share of competition from small system integrators. Mm. And um, to, to go out, like for, for the promise for the last time, but to go back to this idea of the evil, invisible death rays and, and this, this recurring kind of obsessive fear of this technology in that sense. Uh, what is very interesting to see is 
that the exact same concerns existed as early as in the 1930s and 1940s when worldwide AM radio uh, was an issue. There is this urban legend in Switzerland of the uh, transmission tower of Radio Helvetia, the cows around which apparently only gave half as much milk as the cows from the other farmers in, in the canton. And so on. So, so that was the 19, like the from 40s, 50s. And um, this went on with the introduction of more powerful overhead lines and so on, overhead lines close to, to uh, settlements and cities and so on and so forth. So this debate is a recurring one. It comes back every 5, 10, 15 years in, in connection with a yet another uh, uh, electronic or electric piece of technology. So, so in that sense, nothing of this is in any way new. None of these fears are in any way brand new. I could um, a little bit challenge uh, you here is, of course, there's this also one trick or let's say one test you can apply to yourself and everybody else in the audience. Let's say I would come to your door and propose a decent rent per month and I would place a base station on the roof of, of, of your house. It's a very good offering, actually. There's a, a monthly income from renting the base station. It's a, that's a good thing. Would you like to? Would I, would, I, would I have a base station on yeah, my roof? On your roof. I, I mean, have absolutely no idea. <laughs> just I mean, think about it. I mean, it, uh, it uh, looks good. It looks very modern, you know. The biggest uh, gadget in the neighborhood. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the coolest house in the neighborhood. Plus, I could provide you with some uh, booklets about how uh, healthy it is. And, uh, and <laughs> just, you know, think about it. Yeah, and ah, <laughs> once we're already going in this direction, I mean, there are the health concerns and the conspiracy theories on one hand, but there are also advantages to yeah. uh, health care that come up with 5G that are quite important. Oh. John? <laughs> uh, well, um, in the past, uh, Mikrotikels had a customer <coughs> in uh, Greece that was using our Wi-Fi based uh, outdoor wireless ISP solutions to get data from the ambulance after it had uh, gotten a patient and uh, so the hospital could be ready to treat the patient sooner maybe. And I think the 5G solutions will really enable that to happen. So for example, scans or sonographies or something like that could be, much, could be transmitted and the hospital could, could be ready. What do you think? Well, uh, <coughs> clearly there are, I mean, uh, really the good things will start to happen when these examples will, will, more, will be more human, like many kind of safety sensors. I mean, these days to deploy a safety sensor like anywhere, it's quite a complex thing to do. You need to either have a wiring or you need to have an expensive hub uh, happening everywhere. These days I will be able to, or the operator will be able to place a sensor for many years with no wiring, no nothing. It will just stay there and it will be interlinked to the internet just straight with no hubs, no nothing. It, and it, this is going to, to be cheap. And everything starting from health control to I don't know, fire safety to everything else, this will be humanly accessible. It will not be expensive and it will be ubiquitous in terms of, of the placement. And then this will just uh, make life I mean, safer and easier, maybe cheaper, I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, so this will just be humanly understandable examples of, of everyday appliances. Mm. So um, before we open the uh, questions and answers bit, uh, once again back to uh, Microtech and, and, uh, and John, uh, you've got two slides I think that explain a little bit about the things that you actually do. Yeah, there you go. Oh, this. Okay. Uh, so as you are all like a little bit uh, afraid, maybe operators as well, that maybe some other competitor or like some brand that you would not like to use in your re retail or client side. So we, all, we started to, to invest also our money in the research and we came up with a product that could compete and it is more designed for operators. So we'll have our uh, Soho router for customers for residential use. Of course, it can be used for uh, like uh, industrial use as well. So we'll have a higher category Cat12 at the moment. 5G is also coming for this. So you can see it is a nice looking device. You can put your own logo for every operator. <laughs> so you can replace your current maybe uh, 
companies that you would not li like to have in your network. If your like, core is all Nokia, you can replace your custom equipment with our equipment. And uh, we'll have a 5G ready as well for this version and for wireless as well. And we're also working uh, together with the LMT on the 5G solutions. As you all have a leaflet given out on your uh, desk or on chair, if you don't, if you didn't get, we we'll, can provide provide you. So we're working close with the LMT as they provided as a base station, specially designed for or, or between our cooperation. So we're working on uh, making 5G ready products by 2019, and we hope to in 2020 have a 5G uh, product that will have millimeter wave support as well. So all of our products in 2020 will be 5G ready. So you'll be able just to replace a uh, modem, you'll get the 5G. And for uh, chips and manufacturing, Chips and manufacturer are using Qualcomm, well-known company. So, and all the products of these will be produced in Latvia. So, it, then you don't need to be worry about if there's somebody like placing some, some something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the additional fear of large international corporations taking over in that particular niche is not justified. How many, how many companies like uh, like Microtech are there? Are you like one, one of? Just, I'm, I'm just thinking, if there's a, a company like that in Latvia, uh, do I expect another one like it in Sweden or Finland and so on? Um, <coughs> uh, there are some uh, companies that are investing in the similar technology, but I think many of them are more on an industrial kind of scale, uh, industrial systems, uh, where this is uh, kind of competitive prices for the service providers mm -hmm. and uh, and kind of a, a different target uh, market. So yeah, mostly in Europe and the US, they, there are not too many companies targeting mm -hmm. this, probably less than five and at we, the moment. We hope with this product, also for the previous slide, to compete with that uh, manufacturer to get, 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 get a better pricing uh, so the operators can af afford it. All right, thanks. OK, um, anybody's got any questions? And can you pass the microphone around? Kazimir Asadauskas under the Cybersecurity Lithuania. I have a question actually um, about misconceptions or misalignments, if, we wish, if you wish, what we have now in media, what we've been discussing regarding the, let's say, technological dif differences in the technologies of 3G, 4G, and 5G, et cetera. And the second part is, is like, uh, what we see in media, or at least how people um, understand that in this technology, is that the only difference is that, okay, it's maybe, as you explained, is going to be uh, like placed, uh, the sensors are going to, to be placed differently. Yeah? Another thing is that the speeds are going to increase dramatically. But a third part of my question is like, now we also see in the media things like, wars between uh, United States and China in terms of 5G technologies and who is going, who is going to you know, rule that uh, in general sense or you know, people are talking about even in, in different panels that the world is going to be split in, in kind of technological, uh, let's say, ownership of those technologies. So my question would be how would you explain and what would be your insights in what are the real implications of this technology in, in everyday lives of, of the people? That's one thing. And another thing, what's so dramatic about the change happening there that we have uh, you know, things like trade wars between the great countries of the world? Thank you. Well, I mean, what? I did, uh, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, I mean, probably it's a little bit of a different angle to how to look at this. I mean. We can hear the the loudest talkers about are clearly in the USA and in China. Uh, the good thing about being in this region where we are right right now, if you take a look at the Baltic Sea region, if you take a look at Nordics and the Baltics, so within the OECD countries, uh, top six users of mobile data today are actually here. So the Nordics and Baltics, in terms of the customer, actual the actual customer experience and level of usage, we represent the top countries on the planet. So what humans actually use? I mean, all these nice wordings is very good. So the humans on the, the best 
place to be a mobile user is actually around the Mobotic Sea region. The customer experience in, uh, in the USA is way, 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 way behind uh, what we are experiencing here. And also in many places in, in Europe, uh, like uh, uh, Germany is also. So the, the Baltic Sea region is actually at, uh, at the very forefront of what, what humans can get out of this. So this is one thing. So the trade wars is cool. The, the, the guys are having this fun, but I mean, the humans are better off here. Uh, so there is no reason to believe why would we, we be uh, behind the 5G either. So you cannot just jump. If, 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 if you haven't decently deployed your 4G, why would you eventually su suddenly be super leader with the 5G? There is no, it doesn't happen just like this. You have to do your homework with the 4G, then you will evolve to the 5G, uh, 5G experience. The China part is of course, uh, it sounds super scary, uh, and all these wonders you could get out of totalitarian state. I somehow probably I'm old school is still. I still believe that in the long run you cannot outcompete uh, free will and and, and free uh, enterprise and the entrepreneurship in in the long run. As much as you'll teach your mathematics for three years for your exam, it that it, that it doesn't help in the long run. So I still hope that. Uh, you know, uh, free humans will prevail in that sense. I don't know. So um, well, I don't. I don't think there can be much of a divide between the, say, Western or U.S. and Chinese um, technology. The standards are being built on and built on for many years, and there rather the uh, the interoperation between other providers of chips and base stations. So. Uh, the technology will, as it progresses, generally trend where it will be interoperable and there will be no divide. Of course, um, yeah, currently I, I, I'm not, I can't predict the political situation or trade situation, but um, certainly probably in the years to come and five or more years will probably be worked out where Chinese and American companies are competing. I think over time, for sure, or even a lot earlier, maybe. All right. Um, we sorry. We've we've had plenty of questions. A gentleman back there, all the way back there. Unfortunately, we only have one microphone. But uh, yeah, had a question. <laughs> but the gentleman in the back. Yeah. And we'll continue with you right next. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nils Janssons from the Latvian Foreign Ministry. Um, I, following up on, uh, on what I think was this, the substance of one of the questions just before, I mean, the, about the differences of network architecture between 4G and 5G, um, part of the debate uh, in some of the countries which were looking at the Huawei um, issue was uh, whether you can uh, distinguish, uh, whether you can differentiate between the core elements of the system and, and the non-core elements of the system. And uh, I understand that this applies very well in the case of the 4G, which has, a, you know, which sort of, you know, has a central brain and then peripheral kind of less, uh, per peripheral transmitters, if I could put it this way. Now, one also reads that in the case of 5G, uh, the system becomes le much, much more decentralized and it is more difficult to uh, draw a line between core and non-core elements. Is that so? I, I'd, be, uh, I'd be interested in your take on this. Thank you. Um, John? I think, uh, I think maybe Ingmar, is, uh, as a core network operator, could... I will try not to be too boring on with the answer, but the whole, how do you achieve these super small latencies? Everybody is talking about the 5G, like two milliseconds, one millisecond, the sheer speed of light is limiting this. So if you're equipment is f farther than 100 kilometers from the spot you are you're doing this so you cannot achieve one millisecond by no it's just physically impossible therefore to achieve these very small latencies you need to bring out the computing as close to the edge of the network as possible in that sense of course uh, there is this idea of edge computing and therefore the big tendency what will happen i mean these super big uh, data centers, which will be super big, super effective, super centralized, will actually go back and decentralize across the edge of the network. So that's why even 
the two cars will not need the base station to com to communicate to communicate between the themselves. So they can there's the CV CV to X standard which is being de being developed right right now to actually en enable the vehicles to communicate between themselves. Uh, however, uh, we I mean this I mean and you will we actually place a normal usual servers within the base stations. In in that sense, of course the the classical computing world will blend in with the mobile networks. In, in that sense, yes. How, what is the angle of Huawei here? I'm not really sure, but uh, clearly the decentralization will happen. All right, I think we have the next question here up front. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am a, a Japanese journalist. Uh, my, my name is Keiko Izuka. And uh, my question is about uh, information leaks and or data theft uh, uh, through so-called backdoor uh, that the US argues very strongly uh, uh, that is the risk. And uh, to what extent, uh, technically, uh, can you verify that it is uh, safe or uh, as the US say, there is some uh, vagueness or darkness about the, this uh, information leak or theft through backdoor uh, at this moment. Or would you be able to uh, verify in the near future that w Huawei is completely safe? Uh, thank you. Um, I think those would go to each uh, specific situation where uh, our parts or the equipment where companies or security services uh, had some suspicion or wanted to test it. It's not, uh, you know, there's not a really general test and how hacking occurs or, or back doors or they're all very specific, uh, can be very specific, especially in and uh, very sophisticated industrial equipment. Of course, with the internet, people that have routers or things that are hacked, they have attacks that work on a broad scale, but it sounds like a very, you know, these are very specific devices that it would be, it's up to the security experts to, to get down to that. It's very specific. Next question. Hello, Christine Wehr, Zinja Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, following up on that question, um, there's, there is a move across Europe that if there was an exclusion of Huawei technology from uh, European networks in certain countries that would d delay, the, uh, de delay the onset of 5T, uh, 5G technologies and therefore these countries would be at, a, at an economic disadvantage in the short term. For LMD, be, uh, because you have Nokia and Ericsson thus far, not continuing that will not slow it slow anything down, right? Like, but the, uh, but um, do you anticipate, for example, your competitors, Bite, is using uh, Huawei technology? Um, is there a speed piece here? Um, would Germany, <coughs> is the fact that Germany thinks it's going to take it much longer to um, have 5G without Huawei, is that because of what they're using thus far? Or is there something inherent in the, in the parts that would make a non-Huawei system slower to, to put in place? Well, I'll try to answer this one. Um, is that, first of all, it also sounds strange, uh, but honestly, there is no rush, because uh, the standardization of 5G, or the first, you know, f first tier, of standardization was finalized just December last year. So uh, it is just being produced. I mean, everything else that has been launched so far, it's you know, just the marketing stuff. So it's just starting to happen. It will take many, many years to actually understand how to operate properly. Many operators, like for instance, Bitte, they, okay, at, at least so far, have been more so-called price leader. They were not so concerned about being first with technology in, in the market. They were using a classic follower strategy with uh, lower prices. Uh, if uh, you, I mean, why it's slower? Because if there are many operators that are, uh, they would like to s completely switch from Huawei to something else. This takes hell a lot of a capex, uh, capital investment and time, of course. As, as such, that's a, just a big project. But in a sense, there is still competition in between the vendors. 
in in the, in the market. So in that sense, this will not stop. I mean, I but this is of course a, co a costly thing to do. If you would like to, I mean, it, that's big equipment. It's expensive equipment. If you need to switch, it just takes time and, and money. But it doesn't change uh, the te technology development per se. Okay, we have time for one last question. If we've got one more, otherwise we'll wrap it up. Back there. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Liliana Brodic, and I'm coming from Slovenian Armed Forces. Uh, in, 90, uh, in 2014, we had a slid in our country. In a couple of days, you know, there were an areas of, uh, in the country that people didn't have electricity at all. Most of them from three to five uh, days, and some of them even to ten. And just from a sudden, it just feel like that we are in the Middle Ages again. And I would like to know, who is thinking about the backup power plan, you know, in the case when we are out of electricity. Because I imagine the, the next world war, that we're just without electricity and everything will stop. Do you have any scenario yeah, for... Many. <laughs> yes, that's a beautiful question. That's my favorite. Uh, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, a decent telco is, has supplied his base stations with generators. So what we have seen in, in, in history, which is not happening so far today, that normally people are running out of batteries for phones. The base station is still operational. There is nowhere to charge. So therefore, the base station is still radiating, so to speak, but the customer is running out, out of batteries. Luckily, these days, our utility company has improved very, very, very good. So they are forecasting the weather very accurately. So they know where it's going to be bad stuff happening, so they move the forces, so these days have mass massively shortened. So uh, we have the backup generators, that's the simple basic stuff we have. We, we have many of them, it's quite expensive, that's a part for you to be a quality leader, you have the, you know, generators. That's the one thing. That was the history part. The future part is of course the, and also we are operating and cooperating with the armed forces in the, in the sense that one of the um, use cases for evolved 4G and 5G is actually a tactical uh, LT network. These days you can place the whole intelligence of the network in, in about a box this big. So you don't need you know big data centers somewhere in un the underground place. You can uh, run your mobile network from, from, from the back of your track, which is actually a very, very hot topic these days for actually the tactical radio d deployment, not using the uh, classical radio stations, but you, you using the LTE standard in line with all the, because the military has, uh, at least to my recollection, has been quite consciously not, not smartphoneized for many years, and military has avoided all the civil technologies, uh, particularly smartphones. And of course, the disruption the military, military industry will face when it's gonna going to be smartphoneized will be massive because of course all the, I am a national guard myself and I've seen it kind of have first hand experience how amazingly inefficient it is when you need to cause you give your file in there, you know, with the voice command and then somebody's running it down and trying to make a one big picture. It's super, l super slow. The other beautiful part is of course the codification. We are less and less dependent on single data data, so you cannot just shut us down in, in the future because the, the network is going to be cloudified and it's going to be decentralized. It's uh, not that easy. Is the, the other thing and the more is that the actual practice, if you see from what is happening in Ukraine or in Syria, the base stations are very well kept by all sides. So they, they, are, they, they want to make their calls. So <laughs> somehow the base stations still run. So um, it's not that, it's a little bit counterintuitive, so, but yes, that's the... Uh, I want that base station on my house now. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> 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 All right. Maybe yeah. I can add to that. Also, I can add to the same as like you're telling that electricity will be out. The base stations will continue to work on backup generators or diesel generators. And uh, you would like to have communication since like phones will run out of batteries, but 5G also enables uh, such things as uh, IoT, like Internet of Things, sensors. 
So all your like maybe like uh, of course your fridge will be not running, or you will not get the information. But all your smoke sensors, your security like motion sensors that will be placed even like in the sea or somebody's or like all those sensors can last like uh, many years without power. And those all the times they'll be transmitting it back to the base station, which has energy, and you have uh, all this information in your uh, backup central core. So even like the humans will not be able to get like human calls, but all the inf infrastructure that happens all your city, if your like city is burning or not, all the sensors will know that there's fire in that building or not. So that's like a future benefit of 5G. Let's not hope for the burning city. <laughs> thank you very much for the panel and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.